heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Live from New York and San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, chips in focus as equipment maker apply materials. It disappoints on its forecast, while Texas Instruments scores cash from the Chips Act. Plus, Epic Games launches a new mobile storefront after years of legal wrangling with Apple and Google. And Seagram Air, Edgar Brunfman Jr. is close to making a rival offer for Paramount. Is a bidding war brewing? But first, let's check in on these markets because it is a good week. Ed, if you are long these markets. The Nasdaq 100 having its best week in the year. Since November, we're up almost 5%. That is a cool $1.3 trillion being added to the overall benchmark. And it is a significant, well, sigh of relief post-volatility of the last couple of weeks. Once again, we got some consumer data just showing sentiment is on the up-to-date. It counts counteract some of that weakness in the housing data on the day. Look, we're just down a little bit on the day, but it is a strong week. What were you looking at on the micro, Ed? I'm going to go straight to applied materials uh, and a company that makes the machines that make the chips. It's down 3 percent, beat in the quarter gone. But there were really high expectations in its forecast for the current period where the market wants to see that all this investment around AI in particular is translating into more equipment or chip manufacturing equipment uh, investment. We'll get to that in just a moment. The other top story in the semiconductor space, Texas Instruments, set to receive $1.6 billion in CHIP Act grants and $3 billion in loans, the Biden administration announced today. It marks the latest major award from the program that's designed to boost American semiconductor manufacturing. We're joined by Bloomberg's Ian King here on set in San Francisco. A lot of the money's been allocated. Texas Instruments makes all kinds of more basic chips, just the terms that they've agreed with the administration here. Yeah, I mean, the, the way to look at this is nothing is set. A lot of money has been promised. But from a taxpayer's perspective, it's like, OK, you have to do this. You have to go into production. Actually you have to build, build. this. Yeah. And then we'll give you the money. So that's the way to look at it from a, a general perspective. The flip side of it, Wall Street is like, this is how many dollars, how many cents on the EPS that they'll be gaining, how much less capex they'll be spending. Still, they are spending a lot. And it is all about the focus on chips at the moment and the focus on AI. Just take us back to applied materials for a moment, moment, Ian, because, look, the numbers were good, but the forecast perhaps just not living up to the AI euphoria. Yeah, I mean, there's, there are two things going on here. Uh, anything that's to do with high-end logic, which is for data centers and, and, by extension, AI, is doing really well. There's a lot of demand for that. On the flip side, some of the types of chips that, say, are for automakers or for industrial equipment, there's not a lot of uh, strong demand growth there at the moment, so perhaps machinery orders for that particular sector were a little bit weaker. There's kind of a balance of, of factors going on there. That automotive part's kind of consistent with NXP, that, that we've heard it on an ongoing basis. Just real quick, what's the difference between applied materials and ASML? You know, if you think about what those machines are actually used for. Yeah, I mean, think about applied materials as, as much more generalist. They make a whole range of different pieces of equipment. ASML is very specific. It's making lithography. They're, they're essentially the lasers that are burning the holes to, to make the pattern on the chips. Applied materials is putting materials on those silicon wafers. Bloomberg's Ian King, thank you very much. Let's take a closer look at chips Globally, Japan is applying foreign trade regulations to chip-making equipment as part of its effort to secure stable supply chains, the Ministry of Finance said earlier today. Foreign investors are now required to give prior notice when conducting direct investment in equipment tied to chip-making. This in an effort to address the risk of key technology leaks. An interesting global story, Karen. And so much going on with chips. In fact, overall, they are weighing on the overall benchmarks today because of that applied materials number. Let's just get a broader look at the tech market right now. Janet Muir is with us, RBC Bruin, head of market analysis. And Janet, we've had an extraordinary few weeks, to put it bluntly. What are you making of AI euphoria reality and what it means for the tech benchmarks right now? Hi, uh, good morning, Caroline. Thanks for having me. I think uh, one thing is that the valuations of some of these 
uh, mega cap stocks and AI exposed stocks have come down. I think that that is good news for investors who are not invested yet. They can actually get in with a better valuation uh, into companies that still have great long term prospects. And I also think that the rebound, the very quick rebound that we have seen suggests that, you know, if the data is OK, continues to suggest that the U.S. economy is still growing, you know, there is still a lot of demand for these high quality mm. stocks. And I will say uh, our position would be to keep uh, being focused on high quality growth companies, which uh, a lot of these AI exposed stocks are. And I think some of the uh, observations from companies' guiders uh, from the big tech companies, for example, is that they prefer to actually spend more on AI instead of being left behind. So I think that this is still very much uh, a very important trade. Why then was everyone suddenly so nervous around it, Janet? Why do you think that, yeah, we're still 12% off of our highs on the SOX index, but why haven't we managed to rebound to the extent that has your level of conviction? Yes, I think, um, so generally speaking, a lot of focus is still placed on the uh, economic data. Uh, we, we got some relief, I think, in the past week or so with solid economic data and slowing inflation. But I think there are still uncertainties surrounding that. I think particularly for cheap companies, I think the politics of that still play a pretty important part. I remember when uh, ASML report uh, and then there is this uh, suggestion that uh, Donald Trump is going to uh, you know, make it stricter for U.S. companies to export uh, high tech uh, equipment and things like that. And also, of course, the Biden administration okay. t tightening the stance. I think these are still ongoing concerns. So I think that is the reason why the cheap makers are not bouncing back as much as the, the other weather stocks. Janet, hi, it's Ed in San Francisco. I've been reading your research and you've been thinking about REITs, real estate investment trusts. Uh, so have I. And I, I've been writing about how you can look at their pipeline in the context of data center investments. I didn't realize it was such a focus of opportunity for some of the REITs out there. Is that an area that you look for for data sets to kind of work out how long this investment cycle has to run? Yes, I think um, in terms of REITs, I think data center is one of the more resilient areas actually throughout the previous sell-off. I think that that uh, is still a very valid investment point. But what we're looking at in terms of REITs is basically uh, you're broadening out of the other REITs area because simply the valuation has gone uh, much more attractive. And I think particularly right now, uh, we are at the stage where the Fed is going to cut interest rates and you know, expectation is building that there will be you know, further cuts well into uh, 2025 and beyond. So I think you know, risk being a very interest rate sensitive sector is likely to benefit from this uh, monetary policy development. And I think the valuation is just you know, adding to that attractive thesis. Earlier in the show, Caroline was looking at the Nasdaq 100 on the, on the weekly basis. We've had a lot of conflicting economic data. What has the data all told by Friday afternoon told you about the, the state of the global economy? Well, I think uh, everything is still fine. I think <laughs> the labor market is obviously slowing down, but it is actually as expected. Uh, and it, in fact, it is a trend that the Federal Reserve would like to see. If you look at the job openings, per unemployed person. It is going down, but it is basically what I would describe as a normalization back to where it's pre-COVID. So I think this is all positive development. I think we're, we're seeing a slowdown in consumer uh, because the savings are being uh, depleted. But I think the key thing is that real wage growth is very much positive. I think that that is a very fundamental supportive factor out there. Um, so overall speaking, the economy is still fine, uh, slowing but as expected, and we're not seeing the economy falling off a cliff. And soft landing is still very much in play here. Janet, what is then the most important piece of data in the next few weeks? Is it Fed macro? Is it August 28th NVIDIA results? <laughs> yeah, NVIDIA is it's definitely a very important corporate earnings. I think, um, yeah, that, that would be a very important point for us to watch, uh, basically, we know the volatility around that event and the ability to actually spill over to the rest of the mega cap industry. And also, investors will be seeking validation on whether that AI orders is 
is still very strong. And of course, I think any data that relates to the labor market will be a big focus. I think inflation side of things, we got more confirmation that is okay and yeah. unlikely to see a, a yeah. you know, volatility around inflation. So I think labor market data for sure. Such, such a good question by Caroline, though. August 28th, NVIDIA, a macro level event, maybe. Janet Mui, RBC Brewing, Head of Market Analysis. Great to have you back on the show. Thank you very much. Now, coming up, we're going to be joined by Josh Chapman, who is a managing partner at Convoy, a firm focused on the video games industry. And we're going to discuss Epic Games' new mobile storefront, which is out today. By the way, heading to break, we're looking at shares of Rivian. I broke this story overnight with Kyle Porter that they've had to pause the line that makes the delivery vans for Amazon due to a part shortage. The stock declines have really accelerated in the session, almost 3%. It won't affect long-term their production targets. They'll make that up. They're not changing guidance and all the workers will be paid, etc. But it's interesting that this continues to be an issue in the supply chain for Rivian, such a closely watched EV name. Uh, keep tuned, stay tuned. This is Bloomberg Technology. Epic debut for Epic Games. The Fortnite maker is launching a new mobile storefront after four years of legal wrangling with Apple and Google over their app store practices. Now, the Epic CEO saying it may have lost up to $1 billion in revenue after Fortnite was removed from Apple's app store when Epic tried to circumvent that fee with its own storefront back in 2020. Joining us now, Josh Chapman, managing partner of Convoy. And look, it's returning to iPhones in Europe, to Android devices worldwide. Can people get it, access it? What's the pickup? Right now, you can only access the Epic Games Store in the EU if you're on the iOS and globally on Android, as you mentioned. It is an absolute pain to download on both stores. So Apple and Google are fighting this tooth and nail. I just watched some videos that came out this morning. We're gonna be trying it all day today. Is This is requiring anywhere from 10 to 20 steps. There's lots of flags and alerts on both uh, phone devices saying, hey, are you sure? Are you sure you want to download this? So uh, these stores are going to fight this uh, tooth and nail. An Apple spokesperson clarified to Bloomberg that it is a five-step process in, in Europe, at least, not 15. I'm glad to have you on the show, right? You're a firm that invests in video game startups that want to disrupt the industry. That's what Tim yep. Sweeney's trying to do. The argument yep. that if you have more stores, you have a more competitive market, $180 billion video games market, half of which is mobile. Is he right about that argument? He is right that there is, it is better for the games industry if there are more stores, more options, and more competitive pricing. That said, I think what he's fighting for is fantastic and will be positive. And this development today is positive for the games industry. That said, Apple is well within their right having the platform they've built to defend it as much as they can. And so the courts of the US have decided that, yes, they're not a monopoly, they, but they have to allow for third party payments to be processed. Essentially, the way I read that and the way we read that as a firm uh, here at Convoy is that you know, that's kind of a meet in the middle, right? Let's let them do off platform payments, uh, but you're not a monopoly and you got to let Epic Games launch a store on your app store. I mean, the reason that this is happening for iOS in Europe and not here is because the Digital Markets Act and the fact that That's right. Europe's decided that Apple is acting as a gatekeeper in some way, Google too, with these app stores, and they've got to change. But quite often what happens in yep. Europe ends up happening here in the US. So when, if you're saying they're pushing and fighting yeah. tooth and nail, will we ever see it occurring here in the US unless there's our own antitrust issues that are set to bear here? So it took about four years to get to this point, just in the EU. So I think that we're looking at another, just a prediction, three to five years before we see this really happen in the United States, unless a huge ruling comes down from the Supreme Court in the United right. States, if they decide to take this court uh, and take the appeal, which they rejected, I believe, earlier this year or last year. And so I think we're looking at a very long, drawn-out battle. And in the meantime, Apple is making billions and billions a week off of the App Store. And about 60 to 70% of all revenue on Google's App Store and on Apple's App Store comes from the video gaming space alone. And so well, the Josh, reason why they're fighting, yeah. Well, let me just jump in and Cara, I'm sorry about this. We're talking about that, that Apple side of the story. Let's, let's be under yep. no illusions. Epic want to make 
money from this arrangement, right? They have the, yes. the target of 100 million um, downloads by a certain period of time. Ambitious. Will they be successful is the question. I think Epic Games is going to make a lot of money off of this move today. I think they'll make it primarily through Android globally. And then I think they'll secondarily make it on iOS. I think it'll be in that order of magnitude. But Epic Games, as a private company that owns Fortnite and Rocket League and Fall Guys, um, they have now recently launched UEFN, which is basically their Roblox competitor. They watch Roblox have success, so they're launching their own sort of uh, user-generated content platform. Mm. This is a continued effort for Epic Games to increase their margin profile. Mobile is a perfect way to do that. And whether that's an acquisition or an IPO in the future, Epic Games is playing their hand very well, and this will work out in their favor for sure. I think the data showed that some 35 million people played Fortnite for more than 600 million hours in July on Xbox and PlayStation. Just yep. give us the context of how popular Fortnite is compared to the rest of the gaming landscape. Before Fortnite was kicked off the App Store, we as a firm, uh, did an estimate that Fortnite was responsible alone for almost 1% of all revenue on the Apple App Store before it was kicked off. That was sort of an estimate that we kind of did internally. The significance that Fortnite is as a title on console, which you just mentioned, is absolutely massive. And on mobile, which is more accessible globally uh, around the you know emerging market countries, especially, which is why Android's important, Fortnite is you know, one of the top five forever titles, we call them forever titles in, in the gaming industry uh, in the world, right? Alongside that is things like Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto and many others. Josh Chapman, managing partner at Convoy, a particularly great voice to have on a day like today. Thank you very much. Uh, there's another big Thank story you. in the world of entertainment. We're looking at Paramount. Seagram Air, Edgar Bronfham Jr. is close to making an offer for Paramount Global, setting off a potential bidding war for the film and TV company that owns CBS and MTV. Let's get to Bloomberg's Hannah Miller. And Hannah, I'll say the same thing to you I said several weeks ago. I, I'm confused and I have deja vu. So that there's a new bidder and then another bidding war. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Um, so, yeah, we know uh, Bronfen has been interested in Paramount for a while. Um, and things have shifted since then. You know, obviously, there's the Skydance deal that has been agreed to and that there's this 45-day go shop period. So it looks like Bronfman is going to put in a bid. But unlike his earlier interest, he is no longer working with Bain Capital on this and has been in discussions with uh, a couple of different entities, uh, including Roku, Fortress, and the film producer Stephen Paul. So I'm sat here as a B-class shareholder, not voting, trying to work out what ultimately is going to be better for me. How does he push away from what David Ellison is going to offer in terms of technology, in terms of studios? How is he going to make a different kind of appeal? Yeah, so, you know, Brockman is coming in with years of experience in the media industry. He's arguing that this is a better deal for shareholders. Um, you know, he is saying that he can take this company to the next level and you know, putting this potential bid together. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what happens. Ultimately, it's up to Sherry Redstone. Um, her holding company, National Amusements Inc., is the biggest shareholder in Paramount. And what she says, what she says goes. If she prefers Skydance, that's what it's going to be. Anna Miller, telling it straight, we thank you so much. When we're coming up, we're going to talk influencers influence the selection cycle with LTK co-founder Amma Vensbox. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg Technology. politics and creators because as the election campaign picks up the creator economy has been well, on the administration's mind 200 content creators will be credentialed to cover the 2024 dnc in chicago next week this follows actually the white house itself hosting the creator economy conference where it convened a group of digital creators and professionals to discuss the industry's most pressing issues let's talk about it with ltk co-founder president amma vens box who you weren't there yourself but a lot of the influencers that you represent that you help monetize were there why is it important why why are we seeing such political interest in the influencer economy right now 
Well, our LTK team was on the ground. They were there. And, you know, when I think about creators and politics, I don't know of any better marketing machine than the RNC and the DNC. And what we're seeing is that even government is realizing that in order to reach people, you need to be where they are. They're spending six and a half hours a day on their phones. They're in these aggregated content channels. The content that they're viewing is created by creators themselves. The new media has arrived. It's here. Um, and it was hugely validating for the Creator Economy Conference to be held at the White House. This is an industry that we started 13 years ago. The word influencer was only added to the dictionary five years ago, so we've come a long way. This was a really big moment for our entire industry. Emma, can I get political with you for a moment? I don't want anyone to take sides, but just from a perspective of a creator, an influencer, who's doing it better at the moment? Who's managing to reach the US voter base via influencers most efficiently? Is it DNC, Democrats? Is it RNC, Republicans? You know, both are using these tactics and they've both used them for the last several elections and we've seen it across all of the different platforms. Um, that said, I think really, if this is important for the entire industry, whether you are someone who, as a creator that is, is following politics, who is reporting on politics, um, this is a, it's a validating moment. And for some creators, they, they don't wanna to touch the elections at all. Okay. But I think what this points to in this moment is that they're looking to see that this industry is important and that they need to be thinking about the things they're thinking about. And there are definitely a handful of things that are top of mind that we showed up in Washington to talk about. What are the protections here for voters? that creators, as, as we are calling them, get it right, that it's accurate, that it's not false or fake information? Well, you know, for our creators, Joe Biden stood up and he said, you know, we, you are the new media. You're the new way that people are being reached. Um, we know that people are not just listening and thinking about sentiment, that they're actually acting on the things that their influencers that they follow are telling them. We're seeing that, you know, um, consumers are buying $5 billion worth of products from these creators every year. So they're voting with their wallet and not just um, with their mind. So there's a huge responsibility that comes from being a creator. And the acknowledgement that this is the new media is one of the most important things as a creator, there are really key three key things that are, are top of mind when it comes to politics. I'd love to share that if you guys are interested. Just 15 seconds, just go. Wonderful. Well, we're, we're thinking about um, the content that's taken and monetized directly and indirectly and without a license, without permission or benefit to that creator. We're thinking about the implications of creator content being taken to train AI again without okay. the license, permission or benefit to the creator. And then I think finally, it's really important that this in in industry was built on innovation. How are we protecting the innovators who are, are, are creating it? And that's okay. really in the court system through legislation. Thank you so much. Okay, LTA co-founder and president Amber Vensbox. Sorry we ran out of time, but thank you for coming on the show. Coming up, we're going to take a deep dive into software company Autodesk's somewhat controversial sales strategy. That's next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. I want to go back to the chart you showed at the top of the show, the NASDAQ 100, but on a five-day basis. We're actually on track for a second consecutive week of weekly gains. But 5% over five days is actually the biggest weekly gain on that index since November of 2023. And it's amazing how the narrative changes. It was just two weeks ago that we'd had four straight weeks of declines, and we were perilously close to a fifth straight week of declines uh, going back uh, the worst run since 2022. Economic data is really whipsawing us about. And as you pointed out, August 28th and NVIDIA earnings is this macro level event. There's a really big story out there in a specific mover. Autodesk continue to use a controversial sales strategy after promising investors it would stop and then ignored internal warnings about the risks of doing so, according to previously unreported internal documents. The reporter with those documents, Bloomberg's Brody Ford, this is so interesting. So basically, management had been said, told, don't use this, there are risks. They carried on using it, and you found out about it. Take us from there. Yeah, taking a step back, in April, Autodesk said, yo, we cannot file our financial disclosures. We'll come back to you. And the whole market said, oh, my God, what's going on here? This is unheard of for this size of a you know, publicly traded company. Eventually, they said that, yeah, we had some problems with these deals, but it was still somewhat vague. And so 
What we found out through these documents is that Autodesk pledged to stop doing a specific kind of deal that essentially front loads the cash flow. I'm not going to bore with the details, <laughs> but they kept doing it quietly. And the reason they kept doing it is because they were reliant on these deals to meet free cash flow targets, right? We see in these documents that employees warned executives, hey, this might hurt our long-term revenue. This increases the chances of us making a serious mistake, maybe like the one we saw earlier this year, but they pledged on because, you know, you got to meet those financial targets. But th I, this had big ramifications. The accounting probe finished in May. The board decided to remove the Clifford as CFO. I mean, what more could they do to make everyone take this seriously? Correct. Yeah, they removed the CFO. The board decided that a little bit earlier this year. And since then, activist investor Starboard has entered the stock, saying in part the handling of this probe was not good enough and investors didn't get enough accountability. They didn't really know what happened. How wide was the pool of knowledge here? And again, what these documents show is that the pool of knowledge was quite wide. I mean, we see executives signing off on these deals saying that hey, we got to meet these targets, you know, let's pursue them. Um, in terms of ramifications, Starboard is requesting things like considering whether the current CEO is still the right guy for the job, as well as the kind of traditional activist stuff like let's raise margins and, you know, all that kind of thing. Uh, Brody, real quick, and forgive me this one, just the basics of what Autodesk is and does and why people might or might not know it. Totally. Autodesk is like Adobe for the physical world. That bridge behind you, probably Autodesk was used in some capacity to design it, right? Most buildings you see their software was designed for. They have a very interesting vertical that they really own. It's one of those kind of large software markets you almost don't think about because they are so entrenched in their market. It's a very interesting set of products they offer. Uh, Bloomberg's Brody Ford with another top piece of reporting, Caro. Yeah, absolutely on it. Meanwhile, just switch gears, Ed. We're going to look at fintech for a moment because Revolut said that a secondary share sale that allowed it basically to give employees some liquidity for their stakes valued the company at get this $45 billion. The new valuation for the UK unicorn is up from $33 billion price tag that it received back in 2021. And actually, that's the interesting point here. And like many of its rivals in fintech, Revolut hasn't had to raise money since then in recent years. And it's allowed it to basically avoid those sharp declines in valuation that many peers have suffered. But at the same time, let's go to another peer. Let's go to a European fintech that's seeking liquidity, and it's Klarna. And it is inching ever closer to its US IPO next year, with sources saying that the company is seeking a valuation of around $20 billion. Now, the Klarna CEO joined Bloomberg Daybreak Europe earlier today to discuss those plans and his outlook for the company. Just take a listen. People really appreciate mostly about Klarna is that two years ago, this business was, you know, um, very much attractive, growing fast in the US, but also loss making. And in just two years, we have increased revenue by 50%. We have increased gross profit by 100%. And we reduced cost in 30%, which means that now we are, you know, uh, profitable. And I think those kind of financial performance obviously do raise the eyebrows a little bit with with um, okay. uh, investors. <laughs> also, as we have due to AI committed to continue shrinking the company, we've already gone from 4,500 to 3,500 in the last year. And we are committed to continuing on that path, uh, not by layoffs, but simply by yeah. natural attrition rates. You, you've been an early mover on Gen AI. You reached out to Sam Altman of, of, of uh, ChatGPT, OpenAI, pretty, pretty early on in all of this. What's been one of the most surprising things that stood out to you as you've embedded some of this Gen AI across the business? Yeah, I think that the, it, it is, to me, in a way, I would actually partially say that, like, I was even, you know, kind of, pulled into the hype uh, a year ago where a little bit like, you know, again, self-driving cars, you know, we used to re read about them in the press every day. And then you would look out the window and like, where are they? Where are they? It's not happening. And now it's actually happening. And I think that like to some degree, I was almost like drawn into the hype a year ago as well. I was like, okay, in a year, you know, the whole thing will already have like totally dramatically changed everything. And now you almost have the opposite. You hear people like, oh, we tried it, didn't give us the results and so forth. But internally yeah. what I'm seeing at Plana is that it is working. It's just... It will take a little bit further time before it will have the full implications. To us, we've already had okay. delivered some fantastic results, but we're super excited what's coming in the next 12 months. Before we let you go, Sebastian, look, what do we win you back? You're going to list in the US. That's the suggestion. That's the expectation. What does Europe and the UK need to do? Is there anything they could do to win this listing? 
<laughs> well, one thing that I have said uh, to regulators in the Euro, because there's been so much discussion in Brussels as well, how do we create a competitive uh, market? And I, I have suggested, and I actually got some positive uh, from some of the foreign ministers that I was invited by all the uh, finance ministers of EU, um, is that I think that if if Europe Europe will never you know will never agree on like where should listing should the big stock market be? Is it Paris? Is it Frankfurt? Is it you know uh, whatever European country? So the only way to actually get this to work is if if you would mandate all the stock exchanges in Europe so that any stock that gets listed in one is automatically traded in another, I think that could reach the critical mass to create an investor base that is you know, of similar size than the one we see in the US. Because that's really one of the biggest challenges when you make those comparisons. If a company like ours is okay. already mostly US business from revenue size, it will have to be a you know a similar size of investment base and, and stock market size to, to make it a, a relevant listing point. That was Klarna CEO, Sebastian Szymiatkowski. Coming up on the program, we're going to jo be joined by Hiba Amva from the Ericsson Immigration Group to discuss the impact of the election on H-1B visas and in turn, the world of technology. Caro. I just want to go back to that question of dual listings and what certain nations and territories have to do to woo over other companies. Because get this, Avpoint, it's a New Jersey-based company, software company, it's considering actually a second listing outside of the US and Singapore. People with knowledge of the matter have been saying it would be a deal that basically would bring US infrastructure software firm a step closer to some of its big backers. Remember, they had a big chunk of change from Temasek. This is Bloomberg Technology. The H-1B policy, visa policy is really critical for the tech industry, and um, Trump does not have a positive track record there. So I think having a president who understands the importance of immigration in this country is really critical. Venture capitalist Shruti Shah, one of the signatories of VCs for Kamala Group, supporting the campaign of Kamala Harris. And as we look ahead to the DNC that starts next week, H-1B visas. I think it'll be a topic that's top of mind, certainly are for the tech industry. Let's bring in our next guest to discuss. Hiba Anva, partner with the Ericsson Immigration Group. And I ask you there, Hiba, will we get much clarity? Do you need more clarity from the position of the immigration from the Democratic ticket? So I think that the companies that operate in the tech industry, as well as the AI industry, semiconductor, basically any industry in which the United States wants to be a global leader and continue to dominate, um, they're definitely looking for a lot more clarity when it comes to what the next president's policy is going to be with respect to high-skilled immigration. And the reason that this is so important for companies, particularly in the tech sector, is because there is a heavy reliance on visas like the H-1B visa, because when it comes to employees who have the necessary STEM skills that these companies are looking for, demand still very much outweighs supply. And so whoever the next president is going to be, it's really, really important to point out that what we really need for the success of the tech industry and other industries is an immigration policy that actually reflects okay. a 21st century economy. Heba, former President Trump actually gave some detail on how he'd approach visas, particularly those originating from students of U.S. universities on the All In podcast. And then he discussed it with Bloomberg um, in July as well. Have you had any detail or sense from the Harris ticket on a specific approach to technology relevant visas? So what we know about Vice President Harris is that she definitely has close ties to the tech industry. There were 200 tech leaders who came out and endorsed her publicly. Now, as you mentioned, the DNC is right around the corner, so we're definitely going to learn a lot more here in the next few days. Um, but, you know, what what most people are expecting of Vice President Harris is that she's going to continue President Biden's approach to high-skilled immigration. And President Biden's approach has been, in large part, walking back Trump-era policy. I wondered if we could sort of take a, a bipartisan look at the mechanics of getting a visa and the federal administration of visas. I got my first visa in 2018 under the Trump administration and had to renew it in the chaos of COVID. Um, but how easy procedurally is it now in this day, state right this moment to, to get an H-1B? So it's not necessarily as difficult as it was during the Trump administration. 
uh, the experience that a lot of immigration practitioners had during the Trump administration was that the process was a lot longer and it felt uh, somewhat inefficient. I think that that's why it's really important to watch what the results of this election are going to be, because uh, some of the concerns that the companies have experienced is whether or not policy pertaining to H-1B visas and other policies surrounding high-skilled immigration are actually going to act as a deterrent and discourage high-skilled talent from coming to the United States and making the United States their home. And if that happens, then companies are going to run into issues in terms of whether they can remain competitive because they may not necessarily be able to hire the best and brightest from around the world. And perhaps we see what occurred back in previous administration where Canada suddenly got a lot of high skill, perhaps, versus the United States. What about other types of visas? We all focus in so much on an H-1B, but I came in 2018 on an L-1. I mean, how many other routes are there to be and contribute to the U.S. economy? I think that there are several other routes, but the eligibility standards are a little bit more controlled and restricted. And that's why the H-1B visa is so important. It's the type of visa that a lot more people could potentially uh, be eligible for. And as a result, it's the most frequently leveraged uh, employer-sponsored visa by several industries, including the tech industry. And so with respect to policy when it comes to high-skilled immigration, you know, rules, policy surrounding H-1B visas is definitely going to be top of mind. Um, it's really important to continue to have immigration policy that actually encourages talent to come to the United States and innovate, because the next time somebody, you know, founds the next Google or the next Tesla, we still want that to be an American company. Hiba Anva of Ericsson Immigration Group, thank you very much. There are other news headlines out there in the world of tech, Carrie. Yeah, it's time for Talking Tech. First up, we're going to discuss SpaceX announcing it will launch a methane satellite to track super polluters. Now, Carbon Mapper is the nonprofit behind the satellite, and it will be the second methane detecting satellite launched in the past six months. This reflects basically growing scrutiny around the greenhouse gas and the satellite's low cost to atmospheric monitoring. Meanwhile, EU tariffs, they're slowing the influx of Chinese made EVs in July. Now, according to research from Dataforce, the number of new electric vehicles from Chinese manufacturers registered in the EU fell 45% in June. Look, that's as car makers actually rushed to get their products to dealers before the tariffs took effect on July 5th. And Jack Ma, well, he's backing, of course, Ant Group, and it's said to be in discussions to acquire Chinese healthcare platform HowDF.com. That's according to sources. Now, Ant Group is seeing and looking to integrate its tech within the website in an effort to basically beef up its AI services in healthcare. Ed. Coming up on the show, we're going to dig into the WorldCoin project and its mission to tell the difference between man and machine. Co-founder Alex Blanier joins us next. This is Bloomberg. The Orb Before You is made by a startup called Tools for Humanity. If it looks all too dramatic, that's sort of the point. The backers of the company, which include Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, have put $250 million into this venture and want folks to take notice of their orb. This is because they want to use it to scan the irises of as many people around the world as possible, all as part of their main project, known as WorldCoin. If you allow WorldCoin to scan your iris, two things happen. You get a small chunk of the WorldCoin cryptocurrency, and you're certified as a real living human, which the company hopes will lead to a reduction in fraud on the internet and provide better access to banking and social services. Critics, however, are wary about the ethics of biometric collection and the possible exploitation of users from developing countries. You can check out the full episode of that Bloomberg Originals piece on Bloomberg.com. And joining us now is the co-founder of WorldCoin himself, Alex Blania. Alex, uh, welcome to Bloomberg Technology. In Ashley Vance's very detailed Business Week story, he talks about how when you describe WorldCoin to someone, the project, it can sound nuts. And you are cited as saying that you think there's just a 5% probability, 5, that you'll succeed. How do you arrive at that number? 
I think it's just a very ambitious project. And I'm, Ashley and I talked about massive success, so like a large uh, percentage of the kind of people in the world actually signing up and verifying with our services. I think um, that's just a low probability. I think we will, we will increase the probability over time and uh, do our best to succeed. But I think with every ma kind of very ambitious technology company, um, that's, that's probably what you're looking at. And just, I just try to be realistic about that. Give us the elevator pitch of what success looks like, Alex, what the problem is that you will solve. So um, Sam and I started working on this company four and a half years ago. And one of the, one of the main ideas was, of course, that AGI um, and kind of general AI progress will continue. And um, so we started a company called Tools for Humanity with the simple goal of building tools for humanity scale that we think will turn out to be very, very important in a world in which AI will become increasingly powerful. And one of the problems that are very easy to understand is that um, on social media, X, for example, uh, it will be really, really hard to distinguish um, if you're interacting with a real human or if you're interacting with an AI. And um, we, we believe that this will turn out to be a very, very critical problem for our democracy, for, for, many, really th for many things that we care about, um, to protect many of our services against um, influence by AI and, and really make sure we only interface with humans. And so basically four years back, we yeah. thought about how that would work and what technology we would need to build. And so that's, uh, that's what we did. We, we built a biometric device that we distribute all over the world and we allow everyone to verify. And we everyone being so far 6 million unique humans, I think it is, and growing verified by the orb. But the issue here is yeah, how many of those humans actually understand what it is that they're giving you and why they're giving it? There is an argument that people are standing in line in Ecuador and in developing nations thinking they're just going to get reward with a little bit of money and giving over a lot of data that they don't really understand. How do you counteract that? Well, they don't, in fact, they don't give us anything. We, we don't store any data. The, the network doesn't store any data. It's implemented in a self-custodial way and it uses what is called zero-knowledge proofs to give you truly fundamental privacy guarantees. That's one. And then second, I would argue that you don't understand most of the technologies you're using. That's also not the point. I think you understand why you're doing it and uh, okay. what, what comes up for you. But I don't think you have to understand every detail about technology. And that would be my response. Alex, you spent a lot of time flying around the world with Sam Altman to countries trying to convince them if they've placed a ban on the technology to overturn it. You've had success in South Korea and Kenya. There are other countries where it stands. What is the concern that you hear most consistently from them? So we only actually had one ban, and that is um, that is Hong Kong. Um, we we paused in other uh, in other countries to work with regulators, but that is what we expected. This is a very new technology, and there's many questions to be asked by regulators. That is our job. So we uh, we really work with regulators and respond to the questions. And their main concerns or main questions is nothing that um, I think would really surprise you. It is uh, what happens to the data, how does technology work, and all of that, of course, in increasing detail. Um, but we're really happy to answer these questions and, and work with re regulators around the world. Alex, we've just got a, a minute or so left. What is the benefit to humanity that you want to provide with this technology? Well, I think it, I think it will turn out to be truly critical. Um, I think um, services like X, social media, many things that we care about will um, otherwise be really hard to use or very easy to influence. And so I think for um, our democracy, for things that we care about, we will need such technology, and I hope we can contribute with that. Alex Blania, come back on as you continue to build the amount of people using it. Of course, co-founder of you. WorldCoin and Tools of Humanity. We appreciate it. Meanwhile, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology Ed. Another week of earnings, economic data and innovation. Recap it on the podcast. You know where to find it on the terminal, Apple, Spotify and iHeart. Big thanks to the team in New York City with Caro and out with the crew here in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology.